The John Campia Show, in association with Designing Hollywood, presents... I'm your host, Robert Meyer Burnett, and today's episode is sponsored by Paris Costumes. Today's guest is an Oscar-winning costume designer. Over his long and varied career, he has tackled just about every wardrobe challenge imaginable. His efforts have led to Oscar wins for The Artist and Phantom Thread, as well as nominations for Inherent Vice and Joker. He is a self-described showbiz veteran, although, as he says, the nature of the work keeps him real. Noting, it's hard to be too full of yourself when you're digging through boxes of dirty boots. His mission and directive is storytelling through clothing. In 1995, he began his costume design collaboration with Paul Thomas Anderson, designing Heart 8, a.k.a. Sydney. Their next work together was on the critically acclaimed Boogie Nights, followed by Magnolia, Punch Drunk Love, There Will Be Blood, oh my God, I love that movie, starring Daniel Day-Lewis, and Mark also designed The Master, starring Joaquin Phoenix, Philip Seymour Hoffman, and Amy Adams. Mark's seventh collaboration with, with Paul Thomas Anderson was designing Anderson's Inherent Vice, also starring Joaquin Phoenix, which resulted in him receiving an Oscar nomination for Best Costume Design. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce... Did I get it wrong? Did I say something wrong? You got it all. Okay. Well, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce Mark Bridges to the Designing Hollywood podcast. It is so great to speak with you today. I have to say I was very excited to talk to you because you worked for Charlie Band at Full Moon Entertainment on what you said Elvis Mitchell was delighted by, yeah. some like Doll Man versus Demonic Toys. Yeah, first question. Uh, now I have to ask, I mean, I also worked there and there was a period of time in LA where a lot of really renowned low budget filmmakers were either working for Roger Corman in Venice, or they were working for Charlie, first here in Hollywood and then in Glendale when they moved to their big facility. How did you find your, your way working for Charlie in the low budget arena and how did you get into the business? I really cannot remember how I got hooked up with those guys. I hear that a lot. <laughs> at Full Moon. Uh, I know that my first film that I did with them was called Robot Wars. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had come to LA uh, on an invitation to assist a designer named Richard Hornung on a film called The Grifters. Oh, of course. Great and, cast, by the way. Yeah, unbelievable uh, stroke of luck. I, I just was ready to leave New York, and I'd known Richard when he was an assistant designer and had helped him on Miller's Crossing and things, so he asked me to come out. Uh, My favorite Coen Brothers movie, by the way. It, uh, all of them are great, you know, um, and so I came out, assisted him on that film, decided this is where I want to move to L.A., forget New York. There was a kind of a, a mass exodus from New York at the end of the 80s. Everybody yeah. seemed to be coming out here. So I came out and, and worked for him uh, several films and incredible films like Natural Born Killers and Nixon and Dave and Doc Hollywood. And, uh, you know, so I was really fortunate in that way. But I also wanted to be known as a designer. So between the big studio pictures or, you know, Oliver films, I tried to get work as a designer. I, I just love that you were working on movies like Nixon and Miller's Crossing and found yourself working at Full Moon. You know, you got to start someplace. <laughs> but that, that, that's, 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 that's the real business. I mean, a lot of people would say, I'm not going to go work for Charlie Band. I honestly didn't think anything of it. I mean, I come from theater right. where it, it's, it's pretty much you're at the front lines uh, polishing your own shoes and, and sure. doing your own alterations and everything. So uh, that wasn't too far of a stretch with um, 
Charlie. It was theater. <laughs> yeah, it was really. And uh, it, uh, that's, that's how I got hooked up with them. And there were a couple of really nice producers or produ production managers at the time who saw that I was not spending money willy nilly, that I was giving them their costumes on time. You know, it was a professional attitude. So I continued to work there as I was able to. And it was, I mean, the, the thing about that was when I was there as well, the, around the same time, you could do anything. They were making basically a movie a month, yes. you know, and you could jump in and like you said, you worked on Robot Wars, which was the sequel to Robot Jocks. And you had some really great stop motion animators working on those movies. And there was a lot of really talented people there at the time. And you know, as you said, you got to branch out. Were you... Did you always have aspirations growing up, getting into either the theater or film? And and what were what was how'd you how'd you get into the profession? You know, I think there was a grain of of something show busy there, um, <laughs> but also you know Halloween was my favorite uh, holiday as a kid. You know, and we would go to the thrift stores and find things to make into costumes. So that love was always there. Um, I, he, I enjoyed, you know, school plays, fifth and sixth grade. We did like 1776 and some version of Aida. I, you know, I, and <laughs> so that was all fun. I always really enjoyed being in it and doing the costumes. So, and then, you just continue to do things. You know, I was president of the drama club at high school and in the plays and then always involved with the costumes. That's probably where I made my first costume sketch was wow. for my own costume for the miracle worker or something. <laughs> Cause I don't know where in Niagara Falls I would have heard about costume sketches, but um, it was a thing I knew about it and, <laughs> you know, religiously followed Bob Mackey on television because I love Carol Burnett. I love Sonny and Cher. Um, so the costume was always there. Mm. I And I knew that I wanted to somehow be in that world, uh, whether it was performing or what, what it was, I'm not sure. Mm. So you try a lot of things. You just continue to put yourself in the position, you know, work at Niagara Falls Little Theater. Um, but they had an incredible stock of just clothing that had been donations. So whether I was doing a set there, whether I was on stage, whether I was costume designing a, a, a production of the Royal Family mm. from the stock at Niagara Falls Little Theater, I learned a lot about vintage clothes, things, and just became more and more fascinated by those clothes. And it all worked in tandem kind of thing. So by the time I got, and I was working when I was in high school, also on Niagara Falls Little Theater. I directed a production of Little Abner there, um, and then went to undergraduate, uh, first at community college, Niagara County Community College, <laughs> Theater Arts. Um, did a couple of productions there, was still performing, like Dark of the Moon or whatever, was still performing. Then I finally decided I needed to make the break. I went to SUNY Stony Brook, Long Island. They had a performing arts center. So I was able to perform and they had an amazing costume shop and a costume design teacher. So I was splitting my time evenly in that. And uh, costumes won. You know, it just is a combination of everything that I naturally drawn to. Right. Fabric, drawing, painting, dyeing, uh, construction, history, research, storytelling. Uh, you know, and all that theater arts background was great on, you know, analyze a character, uh, you, you know, analyze a play, a story, write something, you know you're in a position to be exposed to a great many aspects of what goes into my work today. So I, I'm always a big supporter of, of, of some kind of formal education. Right. Absolutely. You know, a lot of the designers that I've spoken to on the show, uh, they really lean into that. A lot of them are very formally educated and then 
they 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 learn through experience on the job mm -hmm. you know and it was i think it works in tandem nowadays how important do you feel that a formal background in things like design are art art history well you know and that i also took a year off from Stony Brook and then went to, I worked at Barbara Matera's in New York, which mm. was a big Broadway house. Every designer, I'll never forget, you know, walk out in the waiting room and there's Leontine Price or Shirley Ralph, uh, uh, you know, Liza Minnelli's in with Theoni Aldridge in there. You know, it's where I wanted to be. Yeah. Irene Sheriff shows up, Milena Cannonero, Florence Klotz, Anne Roth, all these designers just show up. I, I learned my way around the city. They would give us a blank, a swatch and a blank check and go, go buy 12 yards of this. So I became known as the guy with the blank check in the fabric <laughs> stores. They must have loved you. Fantastic. <laughs> um, and then I took that year off and then I went to New York University for MFA in costume design. Okay. And I really feel like that, the reason I still think it's important is because I had some raw talent or desire or whatever you want to call it. But this made me understand where it's all coming from. It taught me a discipline on how to, to uh, research, how to interpret your things, different concepts. Uh, I, just, I just felt like it taught me what was good, what was quality, right. rather than I could always be like, the, the wardrobe guy at Niagara Falls Little Theater, or I could have an MFA in costume design. But that was just the beginning, really. I mean, I had world-renowned teachers there. It was a three-year program. And um, I, I highly recommend it. Actually, a friend of mine who was working for me as a PA asked me if, if she should do it. And I guess most people in the business in Hollywood said, no, you don't need to go to school. And I said, absolutely, you should. And mm. she went to that program. And we have, and because we have this same sensibility now, she's worked as my assistant designer on several films because she too has the sensibility about what is quality and where, why you're making decisions. You're making decisions for the point of the story, for the visual, for, you know, three layers deeper than just the surface. Well, I think that that's really important. You had a combination of both. You had schooling and, and, uh, uh, and practical experience, which I think, like you said, you started out young in high school doing productions. Yeah. I think that it can't be stressed enough how important both of those things are. Mm -hmm. Formal education with practical experience. Mm -hmm. Now, you had said you wanted to find a director and hook up with a director. You, you left Full Moon and you found one of the great auteurs working today, Paul Thomas Anderson. And his first feature, um, which I love, I, I know there was problems in editorial and stuff, but and I know he probably wasn't completely satisfied because he had to deal with the studio, but Sydney, AKA Heart Eight, is a great movie. Mm. And in terms of clothes, you talked about working on like Miller's Crossing, Miller's Crossing, I think one of, one of the things I love about your work is you can feel it. Your costumes can be felt. Like if you're watching them on a big screen, the fabrics you talked about, vintage fabric, I, the costume work starting with, with Heart 8, man, you can feel those costumes. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just curious, I mean, is this something that you came up with? I mean, the fabrics you choose, although I mean, the Phantom Thread is delicious. Mm. I mean, it's a delicious movie. Mm -hmm. When you the clothes, I mean, my God, I've, I, I, but it it began Costume. with Heart Eight, you know. Yeah. Uh, at least when I went back and looked at your work, how did you begin, and how do you start? What is your process? Does it begin with the script? Is it the characters? Is it the director? First of all, how did you meet Paul Thomas Anderson? Yeah, a very interesting thing. Uh, got home one day in in 1994, and there was a message on my phone machine. <laughs> saying, you know, uh, hi, I'm a producer and uh, there's this first time director who needs a costume designer and so and so. I can't remember. Someone recommended me to this producer and they said it's a two, three million dollar feature. I can't remember how much it was. And uh, 
the, they had a costume designer, but it went down and now they were getting yeah. back up and they had lost their costume designer. So, you know, would you want to read the script and, and meet the director? And I, I, I was very ambitious at the time. I like to think that I still am, but you know, I was like, of course I would love to, to read a, you know, script or hot diggity. I could be a, <laughs> I could be a designer, you know, and uh, I have my own deal and this is great. This is what you start. He's a first time director. It's a, it's a cool uh, story. It's well written. Uh, I think we, it's funny. I got the script. We went to breakfast someplace and just talked about the script a little bit. And I wanted him to see, some of my work and I had done a short film for Chanticleer films. Mm -hmm. Do you remember Chanticleer? Yes, I do. Where they used to do small independent, have like guest directors or yeah. whatever. Uh, and uh, so they would see their logo. Yeah. The they, Chanticleer it was, logo. and they used to be right in Hollywood. Yeah. Right? Um, and so I had done a film for them, kind of a vent period piece with Vince D'Onofrio and, you know, this sadly recently departed Anne Heche. And uh, I, it was going to have a screening. And so I could take Paul. I said, let's go see my film. Well, this was the days before you had your phone with you all the time and you right. could just refer back to pager. emails and everything. Yeah. Um, if that. So I said, I think it's at the director's guild. So... We go over to the director's guild, locked up, tighter than a drum. He goes, it must be at the writer's guild. So we zoom over to the writer's guild, and it is over there. Okay, they're screening something. And just when we got there, my film was going on. So he got to see it. So, so he got to see it, and I, I think he liked it. Uh, he said he liked what I'd done with the outerwear, the overcoats, and everything. Mm. And we were going to be shooting, you know, twenty four nights in Reno in <laughs> February. Yeah. So we're going to need some outerwear. Um, and I and I got the job. And uh, I think I had a budget of like ten thousand dollars, and there was one person that I could bring with me and then we would have to hire the third person locally in Reno and um luckily Reno but okay so you asked me how do you start with something like that of course Paul always writes things he has he has great ideas and and gives me like some seeds of things on directions to go to so certainly that the idea of uh, Philip Baker Hall being kind of this vestige of the Rat Pack, you know, he knew right. how he knew how he he wanted uh, uh, Philip to look, and then met these new actors, Gwyneth Paltrow and John C. Riley, and uh, you know, I remember the first time I called. Uh, to get sizes from Gwyneth. I think her mother answered, uh, uh, you know, like is Gwyneth there <laughs> 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 and just, you know, she, you know, the mother was like, I'm not giving out any information. Okay. You're going to have to try to call her back. Okay. Oh, okay. I will. <laughs> you know, it's very, I low, need your sizes. No, very I'm not going to tell you. Low tech, <laughs> very low tech. I think I was probably at a pay phone or something calling. Like, well, it's interesting with this. Did you have any inkling because Philip Baker Hall and, and John C. Riley kind of was later became part of the company of Paul Thomas Anderson's work and which you also became part of that company. Did you have any inkling that this was going to lead to a collaboration that would last a quarter century and beyond? No, I, I didn't. I just knew that we were there was something about our working together that was really exciting. Like he wrote a script and characters uh, that uh, was really exciting and how could I contribute to it and mm. how could I help bring these people to life and we would watch dailies on a kind of a wrinkly sheet in the production <laughs> office and even then because they were you, projected you could yeah you <laughs> could see that 
something really special was happening, you know, and the performances are great. And the way he zooms in, he, Paul's very interesting that he does, um, a lot of close-up shots, you even see it in Phantom Thread, but you see it, he did a whole pan up and down uh, Gwyneth's character. Uh, and, and so you could see her leggings and her boots and you started to understand who she was by seeing these things close up. So uh, that that made me really feel involved in a real contributor and, and uh, you know, I was enjoying his company and, and the work that we were doing and he seemed happy with my work and, and it took off from there. Lo and behold, this, his second feature would be Boogie Nights. I mean, come on. I, was, I, I wanted to get to it since you brought it up. One of my favorite movies of all time. I mean, a movie that-, that Mine that too. You can't <laughs> stop watching that movie, but my God, the costumes, dude. The costumes in that movie. I can't imagine how much fun you must have had. It really was fun. And, you know, we had... When you read the script for the first time, did you, did you just cackle with delight over what you were going to be able to do? I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> There's no cackling. Involved. <laughs> but um, it, 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 you sh I had the period down cold. I knew the period. I knew those 77 to 84 had lived it, remember the fashions, you know, uh, how were we going to use them? It, I was on an adventure. I mean, one of the first things that I did is go with my assistant designer to uh, a warehouse in the Midwest where they had all clothes wow. from the period that had never been worn. Wow. They all had tags still on them. And we spent about $12,000 on pants, suits, shirts. I even got a pair of roller skates with red loose sight wheels on them. I mean, we were in heaven. And <laughs> what really did happen was that most of that stuff that I bought there went on most of my principles. I mean, it was fantastic. And, you know, you just, it was very free time uh, to, to be able to bring things to the table and, you know, Paul would have certain requests, like uh, there was a moment when uh, Roller Girl and Dirk come home with Jack and they're, they're going to, Jack suggests that they have sex on the, on the couch. And he, he goes, I want Roller Girl to be able to get undressed really fast, but not have to take off her pants over her skates. So we, I advised this like all you, a, a shirt attached to a diaper kind of a dolphin short <laughs> that looks just like a regular short until she pulls the string, the whole thing comes off. She goes from clothed to naked in like two seconds. And it, it flowed with the scene. It was kind of interesting, but you know, it's, it's a kind of challenge that I love to sure. try to figure out how are we going to make this moment happen on film? And um, just so many satisfying things. I had a great amount of clothes to work with, telling that story of the passage of time. Paul had also written this, this script with like section A, B, C, D, and E. I took it to heart. I didn't realize that he had just written it that way. <laughs> um, so I made different palettes for each of the sections. So, so A, kind of introducing, it's a very 70s palette. And then B, very colorful because it was Dirk's ride fame. <laughs> and then C started with 1980, which was the New Year's Eve party, which mm -hmm. is kind of glittery, lurexy, satiny. And then section D was the dirty laundry <laughs> because Things stuff go to, was going go down hell. hell. Yeah. yeah. So the yeah, Alfred Molina sequence, like, throw Fire all crackers. their laundry into one washer and it all kind of becomes mush. <laughs> and so I over dyed everything in that section and, um, just things, just things like that, that you don't, hopefully you can't put your finger on it, but you feel it a little bit. 
Well, one of the things about that movie, I, I would ask, what's the relationship that you have with actors? Because one of the, <laughs> the costumes in that movie, you know, actors want to look good. Mm. And I mean, Don Cheadle's wearing Western garb. And you're like, was that like scripted? Where, yes. I, I mean, and when you found those clothes and brought it out and said, hey, Don, you're going to be wearing this. What was it like working with, and Philip Seymour Hoffman's, you know, ill-fitting <laughs> wife beaters. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. It, it just, the costumes in that movie are as much fun to watch as the actors' performances in the film itself. Thank you. I mean, but did you ever, when you do something like that, how do you work with an actor? Do you come and, do you bring choices to them? Do you speak with them first? How do you, how do you develop a relationship? Because, man, on a, and on a movie like that, some of those actors are out on a limb in terms of how they look. It's not exactly mm -hmm. the glam most glamorous thing in the world. <laughs> you know? It's different. It's different with every actor. You know, in a way, I'm kind of the ambassador for the director. You know, we've mm -hmm. had meetings about the script and his attitude. Uh, and so I'm bringing what my interpretation of what the director's vision is to that first meeting. I think I went and met Julianne Moore and took her like tear sheets of what I was thinking mm. of for her. And I think she liked it because it didn't seem real trashy. It was like, it, it wasn't super cliche. Like she, and I think she felt more comfortable with that. We had a great collaboration on that. Um, she had a, perfect figure for the seventies. And I had a bunch of stuff and I usually will bring the, the arc of the character to the fitting mm. so that we can say like, she's going to start here and these are the beats. And I was thinking of this for new year's Eve or whatever. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, you know, um, Paul's suggestion for Phil's character was he should dressed like a 14 year old boy. <laughs> okay. Sadly, you know, so what does that mean? How, how much style do 14 year old boys have? You know, they just kind of dress in what they think are, is cool, not necessarily good looking. You know? Right. So, so that, that was what Paul said to me. And this is what we got. Well, I mean, again, the clothes and like the, the, the porn films that they're making within the movie itself, some of the, like Luis Guzman's outfits. There's just which one? There's a well the, 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 within the movie within yes. the movie stuff, and I, I just I love I love the 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 Dirk Diggler. What what was the name? Uh, what was the name of the, the movie within the movie? Um, the the two cops. Oh uh, yeah. You know, I mean, when, when you when you're now making the movie within the movie. Yeah. And um, did you did you look at at 70s porn? Did you look at low budget films? I mean, the clothes you picked for those sequences were just that we made that little that patchwork leisure suit. For oh, my dirt. God. I found the fabric and we made that. It was just too good to to let go. Um, we did. Yeah, we did research in a lot of different ways. There was like a John Holmes. Brock Landers. Brock Landers. Brock right, Landers. Right. That was the name. So, yeah, just <laughs> the the cheesiness of it was too good to pass up, you know, because in reality, those films were like that. Right. You know? Exactly. So I just channeled that a little bit. But, but the leisure suit with the, the with the vest patch. and nothing else. So his arms that, were bare. That was, but Come it's on. very 70s. That's a very 70s attitude about clothes, you know. Um uh, but, you know, research, we did, there was like a John Holmes documentary out yep. at the time. And also I looked at layouts. I think Dirk's first film that he makes was taken right from like an editorial in Hustler or something. Mm. They had like a layout and I had even found a very similar dress. And then when Roller Girl is out in the limo with, Jack, I think that was another hustler layout. Ex the girl was in the fur coat, mm. not with lingerie. Um, but for for Heather and for our movie's sake, we did a little Teddy and thing like that. But that was inspired by an editorial thing, a, a layout, shall we say, in Hustler. Sure. Um, <laughs> and so you know, you just pick up things from research and and channel it. 
Um, you know, Don, you were talking about Don Cheadle's character and how do we approach that? You know, Paul wrote it that way. Right. Paul wrote it that way. And then what those costumes become or how far will you go? And that's where it is working. How f what Paul had written and where I wanted to be and then how where Don felt comfortable. Right. That's all that's that's all on a like a sliding scale. I'm figuring out where we're what this movie is and how we're going to do this character. So I I me working with the with actors is I bring a lot to the table. And I brought it all. Right. So you don't like this. Maybe you like this. You know, um, I don't work. I don't have the experience of a lot of actors saying like, oh, I wouldn't wear that or anything. Like we're there to work and collaborate and sure. we figure it out and we find shapes and we find who the character is and this, this is their vision, whatever. Um, it, it's always fun for me. It's always really, really fun. And especially since we're going in the arc of the character in the story. So that helps them think about it. It helps me think about it. Anyway, that, that's how I do it. When you were working on, on that particular film, uh, a lot has been written about Burt Reynolds and at, at first not really kind of getting it or wanting to do the movie. And yet he did the film and it's one of the great performances of his career. I think so. You know, and he's so good in that film. And, and you got to dress him. And yeah. it's funny to me because he's the epitome of cool in that movie. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure he probably didn't, he personally was like, I mean, I'm the bandit, you know, I'm, I'm already cool, you know? But when, when you were working with him, uh, what was it like developing those clothes, was it the same kind of relationship that you would have with any other actor or did he come in? Cause he was, you know, Burt Reynolds was a mega star. He's Burt Reynolds. And of course I was a, a, a little intimidated by, he was Burt Reynolds. Um, Paul had written this character with the idea that he should wear something that he could write in all day, making his scenarios and, and, and be able to wear it to the disco at night. <laughs> so, so um, it, it was just kind of something that the guy felt comfortable day to night. What, what do I, what do I do day to night? So I found a bunch of easy Guayabara type suit shirts that were kind of typical of Southern California, typical of that period, very easy, very casual. Where Bert came in, uh, I, Bert was great to work with, and uh, I had no problem with that man. Uh, but I and I certainly was there to make, as I am with all my actors, make them comfortable so that they can feel relaxed on camera. Sure. So when that comes to that, you know, we how, how important is that for you? That's like my job. That's my job. Uh, they're the ones who have to go in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. You know, they're the ones who have to feel free or feel like another person or, uh, you know, be able to do what they have to do without thinking about their clothes. They, I want to make a real world for them to exist in so that they can imagine themselves there quite well, easily. Well, you did a fantastic job. Uh, incredible work. And, it began a collaboration. I mean, uh, you were two movies in with Paul Thomas Anderson, but you then started to work with some of the same people, you know, like Joaquin Phoenix, like Daniel Day-Lewis. Mm -hmm. And some of the best work that these actors have ever done was with Paul Thomas Anderson. And then, of course, you were there for these performances as well. And it's a, it's a synergy. But when you start a relationship with an actor and a director, because not a lot of people have these long-standing relationships What's sort of the key as you get to know each other from project to project? Is it always the same or does your collaboration with those, with those artists change the more you get to know one another? Do they have more input or do they trust you implicitly? I think it, I think it's different from each project to each project. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really exciting when Paul will say, uh, 
yeah, I think I'm going to do something that's kind of loosely based on Dianetics, you know? <laughs> he's just like, doo doo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, and he's researching from the day they started and where it came from after World War II. You're talking and, about the master now. Yeah. And it's so it's so interesting because there's like scholarly reading and thinking and uh, 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 behind it. Or he's, I want to do a movie about oil drilling, you know, and, and you know, you're like, that sounds good. We're learning about how rig is built and, you know, the dangers on the oil field and things like that. So there, so there's really, um, his subjects are always, uh, fascinating and, and just really a, a wealth of, of research and things to be inspired by. And he's jumped around like when you when you worked on something like Inherent Vice, did you go read the novel that it was from? I did actually. I did um, because I thought there might be some clues to what the clothes should be. Right. And there were. <laughs> and uh, of course we didn't do the whole novel. Right. <laughs> um, so, what happens is that there's a little framework from or a suggestion from the author. Um, and that was the only time Paul had adapted someone else's work. So I felt like that we want to honor that. And uh, I think at one point he said, like, everything you need to know is in that book, you know. And and so I was like, OK, I'm going to read it. <laughs> Uh, and I'm going to circle things, you know, and uh, so it, it was fun. And then you and then you're presented with what you have to what you're able to find and what you're able to have. I mean, th there, uh, of course, I blank. It's been how many years since we made that movie? I can't remember all the characters names, <laughs> but there is a young uh Asian girl mm -hmm. in the film. And I just, I went to Chinatown and, and just got a bunch of different uh, dresses that were down there that I thought were interesting. And we recut them. There's, and there's some real bold, weird ones that, uh, you know, are interesting to look at. And, and it's kind of a surreal script. And, and so why not have fun with it? You know, yeah. you just, but that's what I had. And, and you try to use things that you have. And then you did with him, I, I would imagine it would be the Star Wars of costume design movies, which is the Phantom Thread. Oh, yeah. You know, and again, when I talk about looking at your work, I love your use of fabrics. Hmm. You know, normally I don't, I, I don't know anything about clothes or fashion, but I know when I, Love when I see great clothes or fashion on the movie screen, I'm like, wow, that's and you know, Miller's Crossing had that, mm. that the, those multiple the, the three piece suits and the, the fedoras and the jackets, yeah, delicious. Rich, Richard was a, a genius with menswear, yeah. Well, the Phantom Thread, I mean, my god, watching that, I have that, I have a 4K, I have that on 4K disc, and it's mm -hmm. gorgeous. Yeah. And and half of it, I mean, it's so sensual to look at the fabrics in that movie. It's just, yeah. you want to be enveloped by that. And when you had that opportunity, when you knew that that was going to be something that you were going to be working on, what was that like for you? I mean, here's the, here's the ultimate movie about clothes. Yeah. Uh, and it was also, everybody understood, production understood that this is what it was about. So... Uh, they gave me every opportunity. We were based out of England, uh, we in London, and right away I was able to do a couple of day trips to Paris, a Rome, oh. to go to, to the. We even went to Paris costume. Actually, <laughs> you did. Uh huh. The sponsor of this episode. Yeah, and that actually, there's something from that place that inspired one of the gowns in Phantom Thread, but. Um, they, you know, I, some of those beautiful fabrics that you're talking about are kind of dead stock from Roman, you know, fabric stores. Wow. You know, uh, the, 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 the gown that they take off the, the drunken woman in the bed, that was from Rome, that changeable green taffeta. I thought money green, 
okay, let's use green, <laughs> you know, uh, just there, there were, I was fortunate enough to, to have a production that understand what I needed. And I went to rental houses and the fabric stores in each of those cities that I was ever, I had two shoppers on that film who were very resourceful in London. They were out all day, every day, um, searching for fabrics or, uh, you know, so it was it was quite good. Um, I don't think we had anything milled for that show. And then, of course, all of Daniel's clothes, Anderson Shepard, beautifully made English woolens. Um, Astonishing. Yeah, it was. And Daniel and I picked the things together. And, uh, you know, Daniel was involved in some of the like color choices for the House of Woodcock and uh, which which I think, you know, lent some authorship to him as far as being that character. Mm. And uh, we'd known each other from There Will Be Blood. And so uh, again, was, another a, a, a film that has incredible costumes. Yeah, I mean, Daniel Day Lewis's costumes are amazing in that film you. as well. And a lot of it has to do with Daniel's personal style and, and, and uh, you know, he, he's somebody who embodies those clothes so well once he is being that person. Well, I think, you know, that sort of takes us up to our, our audience as, as fans of co the comic book genre. Mm -hmm. And you did something I thought was pretty astonishing in Joker. And again, you're working with Joaquin Phoenix, who you had a long-standing relationship with, but you also had this iconic character that people have seen. You've seen him in animation, Cesar Romero's version from the 60s. You had Jack Nicholson. You have uh, uh, the, the amazing version that Heath Ledger played. Yeah. So there was all of these Joker iterations, but you somehow did something different and something new and something that... It was decidedly the Joker, mm. but you didn't rely on the color palettes, the purples necessarily, the way they were employed. Yeah. What was it like for you coming on board, uh, Todd Phillips, the Joker? Was that intimidating? And where did you begin? And how did you, did you look at various iterations of the Joker? Did you have a favorite? Um, how'd you start? It's, it's funny. Uh, okay. Intimidated? Yes. Um, <laughs> But I don't, I don't remember sitting around thinking like, oh, what am I going to do? You know, it, <laughs> right. it, because it just goes back to my process of how do you tell a story? Hmm. How, how do you tell a story? And then with a dash of, I kind of think that's cool. So, um, you know, we we figured out what his clown costume was. He he's works a day job as a clown. And then at night he wants to be a stand-up comic. And I had gotten it into my mind that just for emotional purposes, he owned a suit that was kind of outdated. Like he might've worn it to, you know, his prom or he had <laughs> one suit that he got in the early seventies, three piece, pretty typical of the period. And I thought, I thought it would be cool if it kind of, as his breakdown happens, if it changed color a little bit, it became hotter. So supposedly the first suit is what he wears when he does his stand up. And then the second version was at his mother's funeral, which ended up on the cutting room floor. <laughs> and then, so the third time <laughs> we see it is, is when he reveals as the Joker kind of thing. So, and I had talked to Todd, I go, do you want it to go from bright to dark or do you want it to go from dark to bright? And he said, dark to bright. And I was like, okay. Um, so we made three different suits that way. And then I took the vest from his clown outfit, you know, because you, you ha he can't, it's just not some, the lady upstairs isn't running up a joker outfit for him. Like <laughs> the clothes have to come from someplace. You have to believe that Arthur could put this together. 
So, and he got the vest from his clown outfit. He got the suit from the suit that he always had. And then he might've had that green shirt in his wardrobe, or I could have just thought it was cool. Um, I, I, and, and then the two-tone shoes, too, really was something that I thought was cool and tricky and kind of unusual. You're just always looking for unusual, interesting things. That, that shirt was something that I think I rented from, like, Warner Brothers or something. Wow. And then, of course, had to make... X number of multiples kind of thing. So we had to copy the fabric or whatever, but I thought it was cool. And it worked somehow with the colors. And because it came from somewhere, the, I remember the excitement the day that he shot the scene on the stairs. Yeah, which, which has become a, one of the most iconic scenes of the last 20 years. I, I think so too, but you know, uh, I, I joke and say like, if I didn't have dumb luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all kind of thing, you know, because I, I'm doing it from like, okay, where does Arthur get this? You know, he's this and his suit comes from here and we're showing emotion and everything. And then when it all goes on and it's on there, it's like, Hey, that's pretty good. Wow. <laughs> you know, you're not, you're not like, I'm going to plot and plan this. And this is, this is. It, it it came from someplace organic mm -hmm. and and that's why i'm kind of like hmm, hey everybody liked it <laughs> um and then of course everybody you know is wearing it on halloween and there's cosplay and there's all these things i'm like hmm, every, everybody liked it okay <laughs> so uh but when you saw th that first scene when he's dancing well not yeah. when he's dancing on the stairs yeah I remember I saw that film in a Dolby in the Dolby uh, AMC Dolby Theater. The picture and sound were razor sharp, it, impeccable. And when that scene happens, mm -hmm. and I'm a huge comic book fanatic from mm. as I was a kid, when you're watching that for the first time, it's like this is iconic. I mean, this is something you hadn't seen before. Yeah, I know. And when you're watching it, it's really breathtaking. Was it was it that way for you when you but saw that for the first time? But that's but that's Todd and 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 Joaquin's you know, genius. They were such great collaborators too. And I could be in on it. Sure. You know, making sure Joaquin's good and making and asking Todd, is this okay? How the colorways go. And we're just all, we're all trying to make it as good as it could possibly be. And but there's, there's alchemy involved too. There is magic. Like the fact that it was so monochromatic, those stairs mm -hmm. and in that those colors just exploded off mm. the screen. Crazy, right? Uh, but uh, you look at that, and you're—I mean, it literally, you're taken aback. And I think, you know, a lot of your costume design, it doesn't overshadow. Like it didn't. You don't stop watching the movie and think, "Well, look at those colors." Mm -hmm. It all works mm -hmm. within the, the film. You know, it all part of the the mise en scène of the whole Hopefully. sequence works fantastic. And I think that, you know, your your work has a very unique quality in that. You know how everything's shot digitally now. Yeah. But when you watch something that's photochemically shot, you can see the grain patterns and there's yeah. something that's movies. Yeah. Your costume design is kind of like that. When you see it, it has a very tangible quality, even on, you know, on the screen. Yeah. And it's, you can, you feel like, I'm like, I want to wear those clothes. That's the mm, few. I, I just want to feel those fabrics around me. And that's something that you have that's kind of a, an indelible thing in your work. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I really, I don't know. I'm a little bit old school. I, I come from, you know, I was exposed to all those Broadway shows and all those Broadway designers, mm -hmm. you know, at Barbara Matera's. Uh, I remember, I, I've systematically watched all these fabric stores slowly go away. I remember when there was more than one tailor in Hollywood. I remember, you right. know, uh, so I love fabrics and I, and I feel like they have a character too. So part of my storytelling is that texture. Part of my storytelling is, is using those fabrics is the way an artist use paint or what, mm. you know, I think. And so I just happen to have that uh, voice. Uh, 
And I, to, to wrap up, I'd be remiss because I have to ask, what's it like to win an Academy Award? It's pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> pretty great. Uh, you know, the first year was in 2012 was for the artist, and that was the darling of the Oscars that year, winning Best when, Picture yeah. and Jean Dujardin. And, you know, that film, when we did that film, it it was like a $10 million film here in, in town. Nobody knew. I think you some electricians were asking the director, like, so how are we going to be able to see this film? You know, because there was a good chance it would just be get collecting dust in some <laughs> French blockbuster someplace, <laughs> right. you know? Um, because it was so unusual. And, and then it went to Cannes and the world saw it and the world took it to its heart so um that it was really fun and and you know you do a lot of publicity and you do a lot of press and you look at your colleagues who are all really talented and you're just like i made it this far this is kind of amazing to begin with and then to actually win it is just you know you're prepared because if you're nominated there's a chance you could get it so um <laughs> You know, uh, but it was one of the exciting nights of my life. Of Amazing. Course. Yeah. Congratulations on that. Thank you. And on your other win. But I have to ask, um, we always want to give the new generation some place to start. What advice can you give to anybody who wants to get into this nutty profession now? Where, where, can, they, where can they begin? You know, this, this business, I do see it as something different from when I started, you know, there was a lot more non-union stuff happening. Uh, it's it's a very much more organized town than it was uh, 30 years ago. Mm. Um, I, I really, I, I think do whatever you can do and do a great job at it. Whether that's being a PA for me or one of my colleagues, the cream rises to the top, honestly. You, ha you go the extra mile. You, you, I would say don't try to get into this unless you really love it because it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of hard work and it's a lot of uh, uh, deciding priorities of your life a little bit. Right. Um, so, but do as much as you can. See as much as you can, because you'll start to get a sense of what works, what doesn't. Start to look at things with a critical eye. I very many, many years ago, I used to keep a little notebook about what things work. And I found it recently. I was kind of laughing about it, but I was like, well, yeah, that's still true. <laughs> um, so I think look at things with a critical eye, put yourself in the place, you know, there used to be a New York lottery thing, like got to be in it to win it, you right. know, <laughs> you know, just dreaming about it. You got to put hands on clothes. You got to discover what fabrics are. You, you have to look, I, I'm a huge uh, classic movie fan. Uh, I didn't even ask you about that. Yeah. What are some of your favorites? You know, yeah, just to, what do you got? I mean, <laughs> I'll watch anything. I was watching some ridiculous, you know, uh, Eleanor Powell movie yesterday. And, uh, you, and then I'll just, it's, it's like a nothing movie, but then I'll look at a shot and I'll see like, uh, huh. You look at her because she's the one who's got the white hat and the white collar and everybody else kind of falls away. So like there's always something to be gotten out of looking at uh, the past a little mm. bit, you know, How, the graphics. I do that on my films, too. I really try to take your eye to the principal. Um, sure, the camera's doing that. Maybe lighting's doing that. But I'm helping. I want to yes. help Just direct your eye to where it's supposed to go. So so if you're learning like little things like that, it just happens to be my thing. Sure. You know, now can people follow you on social media? I am on Instagram on a very, very pedestrian feed <laughs> of like, 
hey, I'm going to be on TCM or here I am baking <laughs> cookies with my nieces. You know what I mean? It's very, it's not certainly shrewdly geared towards anything other than fun. Right. Other than fun. Is it your, under your name? Is it it's at Mark MB Bridges? Costume. MB Costume. MB Lower Dash Costume. Yeah. All right. Well, Mr. Mark Bridges, thank you so very much for being on the Designing Hollywood podcast. It was a real thrill and an honor to speak with you today. Thank you. And thanks to our sponsor, Paris Costumes, for sponsoring this episode. One of the best. 